Brian is an associate professor uh, with a joint appointment in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, where he also got his PhD in 2010, going on to win the ACM Dissertation Award that year. Um, he worked then uh, for Microsoft Research uh, for six years, and then he came back to CMU. Uh, he's received numerous awards uh, and accolades, so I'll just mention a few. He's been listed in the 30 under 30 uh, science list uh, from Forbes. He's received uh, the, the, uh, the best paper award at the IEEE uh, Symposium on Security and Privacy and the USENIC Symposium on uh, Network Systems. And today he's going to talk to us about his, uh, his designing tools and methodologies to help us uh, create uh, software libraries that can be uh, automatically verified and so help uh, our job in designing more secure systems. So, Brian. Thank you. And my name is Brian Parno, and I'd like to thank all of the organizers for asking me to come out and talk to you today about some of the work we've been doing on <coughs> formally verifying the security of critical software, <coughs> particularly cryptographic software. So this mo work was motivated by looking at the HTTPS ecosystem, which, as many of you probably know, is a critical piece of our software infrastructure today. So it's used by over 40% of all internet connections, and it's used not just for web, but also for VPNs, for emails, just about everything. And why is that? It's because we, as security professionals, tell people, don't invent your own crypto. Don't invent your own protocols. You will inevitably screw it up, and so instead you should use something that's well-tested and understood, like HTTPS. Unfortunately, HTTPS is actually a very complex beast. Right? It's not just the HTTPS at the top, it's also the standards for certificates, X509, ASN1, it's the TLS protocol itself, and then it's all the cryptographic algorithms and the low-level operations that underlie them. And of course, if you look at in terms of volume, there are over 100 pages just informally specifying the TLS the protocol. If you look at the implementations, OpenSSL is almost 300,000 lines of C and assembly code. And even boring SSL, which is supposed to be a slimmed down version of the protocol, is still almost 200,000 lines of C in assembly. So it probably shouldn't surprise us that historically we've seen bugs in every single one of these components, right? And these bugs range from low level buffer overflows like Heartbleed, all the way to fundamental problems with the protocol itself. So even the standards themselves were flawed. And this is not just one implementation. I'm gonna mention OpenSSL a lot, but it's not that OpenSSL is particularly bad, it's that th these flaws affect everybody. And we all don't actually see a plateau either. Right? It's not that the software is generally getting better and sort of aging like wine, it seems more like milk right now. So inspired by this, this problem, we've started the Everest project. And our goal is to develop verified replacements for this entire ecosystem so we can put a stop to this continual cascade of uh, high profile vulnerabilities that we see in practice. So more concretely, our goals are to develop verified replacements for each one of these components and furthermore, to verify that the collection of components together give you the abstraction that you want, namely a secure, authenticated channel to the remote party. Now, we also don't want this to just be an academic project. We want it to be actually achieve widespread deployment to the point where it's a two-line change to your current deployment, and you can start running our verified software. And so we want to make sure that we can interoperate with existing systems, we want to be standards compliant with the latest versions, and we want to be fast. In, in fact, we want to be at least as fast, if not faster, than unverified implementations, so nobody has to choose between fast and secure. We're, the goal is that they can have both. And finally, our, we're developing these, the software using a number of verification tools, and along the way, we're trying to make the verification tools easier and more trustworthy. Not just to make our lives easier, but so that somebody else can come along and say, hey, you've done TLS and HTTPS, but I really care about QUIC or Kerberos or some other protocol, and th these, these tools can see wider use as well. So along the way, we, there's a number of challenging research questions that we're trying to address. Things like, how do you assess whether a protocol is actually secure, especially when you have to run it alongside pro protocols like TLS 1.0 that we know are insecure? And I mentioned performance before, so we want to know how we can get uh, good performance despite de designing our code to be verified. We want to handle the kinds of advanced threats like side channels and other attacks that are discussed at conferences like chess. And of course, we want to figure out ways in which we can instill confidence in these verification tools and develop an ecosystem where it can be sustainable. Right? So if we finish the project and then wander off, we want other people to be able to 
pick up these tools and keep moving forward with them rather than having code that just bit rots on the side. So this is a, a very large scale effort, primarily spread between different Microsoft research labs, INRIA in Paris, and now uh, Carnegie Mellon as well. And it's still an ongoing effort, we're, we're part way through, and it, this is an area that interests you, you're, you're more than welcome to join in. So this is, gives you some sense of how far we've gone. We've devoted a lot of attention to cryptographic software and to the TLS protocol, as well as the parsing and handling of X509 and ASN1. We are still working our way up the stack to the point where we'll address HTTPS itself. Along the way, we've generated all kinds of academic publications, which is nice. Uh, we've also had a number of spin-offs. So we've had some work on QUIC, which is a, a related protocol that came out of Google. We've been working on verified reference implementations and actually informing the standardization process of TLS 1.3 itself. So our, our team, along with a number of academic groups, have been looking at the, the TLS 1.3 standard as it was being developed, and since, since it's one of the most thoroughly vetted standards we've ever seen. And, and it's great that we can actually start to get ahead of the curve and start patching the standard before it goes out to the wider world, rather than five, 10 years later. We've also had uh, some success deploying portions of our verified code in actual real world software. So it's being used at Microsoft inside of a couple of blockchains. It's also being used by the Linux WireGuard VPN and Mozilla Firefox. So if there's any Firefox users out there, you've probably used some of our, our verified cryptographic software. So today I'd like to focus on one portion of this overall project, and namely on EverCrypt, which is our verified cryptographic provider. Some of you may be asking, wh why verify cryptographic software? Particularly things like AES, right? It seems like it can't be that hard to get right. You run some test vectors. If it comes out the way you expect, everything should be good. But of course, cryptographic software is critical, and so bugs anywhere in that software is going to undermine the entire enterprise of developing secure software. And furthermore, we see a steady stream of vulnerabilities in this cryptographic software. So it's not that like, we've completely solved the problem or that we can know how to write these algorithms uh, effectively and securely. And if you look at the way these bug reports are written, you'll notice that there's a couple of themes. First, a lot of these vulnerabilities only affect a specific platform, right? So it's a bug on the 64-bit version, but not the 32-bit version. Or it's a bug on one of the advanced instruction sets, like SSE or AVX, and not, not some of the other flavors. And people respond to this by saying, well, let's do some more random testing. And of course, we all know that with these cryptographic algorithms where you have gigantic inputs, we're never going to exhaustively test anything by exploring randomly. Right, so we need something more systematic. And of course, as you're all aware, we also have the problem of side channels, right? And in some areas of security, we like to sort of brush side channels under the covers and say, oh, that's not a really a big problem, we'll focus on other things. But when it comes to cryptographic algorithms, we've actually seen attacks based on side channels. And so it means that our job of verifying and developing software is even harder because we need to take these side channels into account. So how do we wind up in this mess? Why do we see so many vulnerabilities year after year? Well, if you take a look at OpenSSL code, I don't know how well you can see this on the right, it's actually a mix of Perl, assembly, and C preprocessor macros. And it's customized for over 50 different hardware platforms. So if you look, take a look at some of this code, you start to wonder, why are we trusting 40% of the internet's traffic to code that looks like this? And the, the common answer is that we want performance. The world wants performance, they want their code to go as fast as possible, and the cryptographic software is typically the bottleneck for a lot of these applications, and so we choose performance. So if you look at OpenSSL and compare it to other popular open source libraries, it usually meets or beats their performance, and it does that by, in part by taking advantage of platform-specific optimizations, right? So ASNI buys you at least a four to eight X improvement over just a vanilla C implementation or even uh, sort of vanilla assembly implementation. And so we have this combination of a desire for performance, and that leads us to create complex, ugly code, which then leads to vulnerabilities. So stepping back a level, what does an average programmer want when they reach out to grab a, a cryptographic provider? Right, something like OpenSSL. Why are they turning op OpenSSL? Well, they want something that's usable, right? They want something that's written in C or assembly that they can easily plug into the project, not something written in some esoteric research language that they've never heard of. They want something that's comprehensive, right? They don't want to have to go out and find, oh, this library will give me RSA, this library will give me AES. They want something that will provide all the cryptographic needs in one place. Ideally, they'd like something that does auto configuration and multiplexing, right? So if it's running on an Intel CPU that supports AES and I, it should automatically choose an optimized version for that. And if it's not, it should fall back on some more generic algorithm. And that should all happen under the covers. That shouldn't be the application developer's responsibility. Ideally, we, we would like to be moving towards cryptographic libraries that offer agility. So that means that you should have a single unified API for something like hashing, 
where maybe you, you specify which algorithm you want, but other than that, the API is perfectly uniform. And that should make it easy to switch to a, a new hash algorithm if we discover a flaw in SHA-256, rather than taking five or 10 years to migrate away from SHA-1, as we saw in, in the past. From a research perspective, we have a slightly different set of criteria, right? Nobody actually wants to verify C or assembly because it's a mess. We'd much rather verify languages that are designed for verification. We'd also like to focus on programmer productivity, right? We're all busy people. We'd like to program as efficiently as possible and not spend a lot of time customizing for each individual platform. Of course, we, we also like auto configuration because it's very embarrassing if you have your verified software and you hand it to somebody and the first thing they see is a, a blue screen because they used an illegal instruction. Finally, we'd like to have deep integration, meaning that even though we might have multiple implementations, say one for AS and I, one for written in C, they should both verify to the exact same specification so that the client can be ignorant and blissfully ignorant of what's happening underneath. And in particular, we can enforce that through abstraction. Right? So we say, we're not gonna tell you what's happening inside, we're just gonna promise you that we've correctly implemented this crypto and you know, don't need to worry about which particular implementation or what kind of optimizations we've done internally. And so ultimately our goal with Evercrypt is to produce a comprehensive verification result without giving up on performance. We wanna give you the best of both worlds. So looking at a little bit more detail, at a high level, Evercrypt is designed to serve both unverified C clients, so you can use the crypto directly, but also to serve higher level verified software. Right? So we want to be able to have this, this verified TLS layer run on top of Evercrypt, as well as other clients like a, a Merkle tree library. Internally, Evercrypt is written in a combination of verified C-like code and verified assembly. The assembly lets us go fast, the C code gives us a generic fallback. And overall, Evercrypt is aiming to offer features like agility that I talked about before to make it easy to switch to new algorithms, multiplexing so that we can optimize for individual platforms, and abstraction, both to allow us to change in the future and to hide extraneous details from verified clients that come along later. Okay. <clears throat> To give you a sense of what we've achieved so far, we actually, uh, I think, feel fairly good about claiming that Evercrypt is comprehensive. It offers a wide variety of functionalities from authenticated encryption to hashing, message authentication, symmetric crypto, key derivation, and other popular crypto functionalities. And we've got both generic implementations in C that should run on just about any platform, as well as some targeted optimizations for hardware-specific features. So, that gives you a broad view of the project. In the next couple of slides, I'd like to step through how we verify each layer of the project, starting at assembly, working our way up through C and cryptographic constructions, all the way up to the applications that might use something like Evercrypt. <clears throat> so I, th I think I've alluded to these requirements before, but when we're developing cryptographic software, we want several properties. First, we'd like it to be correct, right? So if we think we're implementing AS or we think we're implementing ECC, it should really do that and nothing else, okay? And so, People in the formal methods refer to that as functionally correct. So it's actually implementing the function that we intended and not something else. We'd also like it to be secure. And in that case, what I mean is that it follows the intended control flow and it does not inadvertently leak information about our secrets, say through timing or through uh, leaving state lying around after the program ex finishes executing. And finally, we want it to be fast. We want it to be able to take advantage of both platform agnostic and platform specific optimizations. Historically, it's been difficult to meet both or to meet all three of these requirements. And so we've wound up with implementations that are either fast but unverified, like OpenSSL, or verified but slow. So there's been a number of uh, verification experts in the academic community, and many of them have had to give up on performance in order to get the verification results to go through. So just as an example, if we look at SHA-256, there's been a couple of uh, efforts to verify the, the correctness of code, some of it even taken from OpenSSL but typically it's taken some of these slower variants of OpenSSL. And so the result has been something that leaves us with a, a substantial performance gap compared to unverified code. And historically the world cares more about performance than they do about speed, than about the, the security of their software, particularly when you're talking about two to five to 10X overheads. <clears throat> if you look at how OpenSSL is achieving this speed, start to dig into the details, you'll notice that it's actually mixing assembly and Perl and it's building up a, a giant string inside of Perl representing the assembly code. That lets it emit things like, uh, both based on the, the Perl variables, and then it also embeds C preprocessor macros to customize based on which platform you're running on. So in this case, for a particular variety of ARM, it's gonna emit some instructions, in other cases it won't. 
It also uses some macros to specialize the code. So in the 15th round of this particular algorithm, it's gonna have some instructions, and in the other rounds, it won't omit those instructions. Okay, there's more, more complexity. So it uses a Perl for loop in order to do loop unrolling. Right, so it's much more succinct to write it as a for loop, but the actual omitted instructions are gonna be unrolled so that you can save a register. Furthermore, it's going to assign register names based on Perl variables, and then it's gonna use some Perl tricks to shuffle the names of those variables so that you can avoid extra moves during the, the SHA algorithm. Okay, so these are all fancy tricks. They also do some things where they actually take this string that's omitted by Perl and interpret it with another uh, Perl function in order to do some mathematical operations inside. So this is not the kind of thing that's designed to feel, make you feel warm and fuzzy about the, the security of the software. I'm actually amazed that they get this code right, and I, I have a great deal of respect for the people who develop the software this way, but I think their lives are very hard. And the result is something that looks like this, right? So if you are the developer of the software, maybe you have some chance of understanding it, but for most of the rest of us, it's actually very hard to look at this and convince yourself even what algorithm it's implementing, let alone that it's correct, or to debug it, or to ultimately prove that it's doing the correct thing. So we developed a tool called Veil that's designed to give you a, a firmer foundation with de designing code like this. In particular, the goal is to give you a flexible framework that can target multiple architectures and that can prove that the software is correct and secure without giving up on performance. So how do we do that? Veil supports flexible syntax that allows you to adapt the tool to different platforms. So the tool itself is agnostic to what platform it is, and so you can target it at any platform you choose. It's high performance in the sense that we can actually generate code that's identical to OpenSSL so we can match their performance, and then we can tweak it to go further and in some cases actually exceed their performance. And finally, it's high assurance because we can actually generate formal proofs about all the code that we're writing in Veil and check that they're actually correct using a machine to do the checking for us. So let me give you some examples of c constructs in the Veil language. So at the base, we have just standard assembly instructions, right? So you can define what it means to do a move on your architecture, what it means to do a shift, or something more complicated like here's the AES keygen uh, assist instruction. We also have use structured control flow, since that seems to be what most cryptographic implementations go with, and it makes the verification process easier. And finally, we have optimization constructs that allow us to play some of the same tricks that OpenSSL was doing, but in a more principled way. So let's take a look at one of those examples. So we have the notion of an inline if statement, and this is an if statement that's evaluated not at execution time, but while we're actually generating the code, while we're actually emitting the assembly code that will then be assembled into the executable. So for example, we can do a check to see which platform are we emitting code for. We can emit different code for the uh, x86 instructions or for ones that support advanced instructions. We can also use it to do loop unrolling, similar to what OpenSSL was doing, but it, in a way that allows us to verify the loop before we do the unrolling. So let's look at a concrete example here. So suppose that we want to emit a sort of arbitrary number of add instructions, right? So we can write that as a single recursive loop here and invoke it with, say, 100. When we do that, that's gonna generate an abstract syntax tree, an AST, that consists of 100 add instructions, and that will then produce 100 add instructions that will be processed by our assembler. So the nice thing is, as a developer, you can write four or five lines and verify just those four or five lines, and then underneath, is provably secure to unroll that to this, this large, hopefully more performant executable code. So that gives us fast code. It still leaves the question of how do we prove that it's actually correct? So to do that, we've developed a Veil tool and a Veil language that you, you write your cryptographic implementation in. It should look fairly familiar to you know, standard assembly programming. And the tool is going to produce an AST representing the program, and it's gonna write, automatically produce a number of lemmas about properties of that program. The programmer will also handwrite some lemmas to help the, the verification tool with some of the hard bits, and we're gonna feed that into a proof assistant along with the specification of the cryptographic algorithm. So we'll say, here's a, a succinct description of what it means to compute SHA. Please check that this AST actually computes SHA. And the proof assistant is going to answer us and either say yes or no. And the assistant that we're using is sound, meaning that it will never accept a program that is incorrect, but it's incomplete, meaning, and that's why we have to provide these extra limos to help it along so that it can see that our correct, hopefully correct code is actually correct. Of course, to prove that our implementation is correct, we have to have some semantics for the machine we're going to run on. Right? We have to know what it means to do an add instruction on this particular architecture, and so we have to develop semantics for the architectures that we're targeting and then feed that into the proof assistant as well. The actual verifier that we're using at present is called f-star. It's a, a functional language that looks kind of like ML, but enriched to provide, to provide general proofs. 
It's based on the Z3 solver, so a lot of it's automated and is able to see a lot of the, the pr low level proof steps automatically, and so we help it with the higher level proof steps. We also have a backend for Daphne, which is a, a verification language targeted more at C Sharp or Java developers, and in theory we could target other, other backends as well, like Kafka or Isabel. So once we've verified our program and the, the verifier has signed off, we have a, a trusted printer that's going to print the actual assembly code, and then a assembler, uh, either something from the, the GNU tool chain or something from the Microsoft tool chain, can process that and produce the executable we're going to run. At a high level, we can divide this into uh, various levels of trust, right? So we carefully design the system so that we don't actually trust the veil tool. So the tool itself and the code and the lemmas that the programmers write are all untrusted. If there's a bug anywhere in there, it'll be found when we feed it into the verifier. Of course, we have to verify, we have to trust that we got the semantics of the platform right. So if we say that when you do an add instruction, it actually does subtraction, then obviously the, when you actually execute the program, we're gonna get a different result. We have to trust the cryptographic specification, right? So we have to trust that we correctly took the RFC for SHA and translate that into something machine readable, and we trust the, the assembly printer. But overall, the trusted computing base is relatively small and can be used to verify ar arbitrary amounts of cryptographic code on top of it. Okay, so when I say that we're verifying software, that often sounds somewhat esoteric. It sounds like something that monks do in some exotic village and so not something that anybody would do in their sort of day-to-day -day life. And so I think it helps to demystify the process if I show you a small example here. So this is the, the language Daphne that I mentioned earlier. It's designed to look kind of like C Sharp or, or Java. I'm using it because it's uh, nice for demo purposes, but the experience of verifying assembly looks, looks fairly similar as well. So here, hopefully you can see that we've got a, a small uh, procedure where we're hoping to duplicate an array. Right? We're taking an array of integers and a length, and we're going to copy it over. Right? It's pretty straightforward. So just like in Java or C Sharp, we're going to start by allocating an output. Oops, that's some glue. So we're going to say that we return an output array. Integer. And we're going to allocate that output array. New int length. And in the background, the verifier is running and automatically checking whether we've made any obvious mistakes. So you can see here it's highlighted the fact that we might have just tried to allocate an array using a negative value, right? Length is an int, and so this is clearly an illegal operation and might result in undefined behavior. So unlike in a, a dynamic language, or a standard language, where you might add a dynamic check to say, hey, is length greater than zero, then do the allocation, otherwise do something else. In Daphne and other verification languages, you can actually add a precondition. So up here we can say we require the caller to prove that length is non-zero. So that is going to become an obligation on the caller, but given that, that fact, we can actually prove that it's safe to do this allocation. Okay, and, and that's not something that will be checked at runtime, it's something that's statically checked by the tool. So, now that we can allocate our code, we can do write a, a standard little loop here. Say while well, i is less than length. And because I've been doing this for a while, I know that Daphne needs a little bit of help keeping track of where this index variable is. So I'm gonna add a, a loop invariant to keep track of what we're doing at each stage. I'm gonna say that the output of i is equal to input of i. Hopefully these typos are convincing you this is a live demo. And again, in the background, more or less in real time, we're getting feedback about the correctness or incorrectness of this code. So we can take a look and see, in this case, Daphne is worried that we might have just dereferenced the null pointer, right? That's a very common er way to make an error in a code. And so again, rather than adding a dynamic check, I can add a, another precondition that says, please don't call us with a null input. So it's your responsibility to filter out nulls. And so that gets rid of that problem. The next problem is a little bit more subtle. It says that we might have an index out of range, right? And some of you may be wondering, that, that seems a little odd, right? We said that i starts at zero, we, we, we loop until we get up to length, and we're indexing into input. But, of course, the problem is that while I called this input and I called this length, there's nothing binding the two, right? So I had something in mind when I wrote that, but there's nothing actually con connecting them until I add one more requirement that says that the input, the actual length that we statically analyze the program to have here is equal to len. Given that, we now know that this is a, a safe index, a sa safe access, and the program is happy. Finally, there's one other problem here, which is that Daphne isn't convinced that this program is going to terminate. And that's a property that we probably want from our cryptographic code. And so here, I've forgotten to add our increment. There we go. Okay, so now we've proven that we don't have any sort of obvious bugs in the program. 
but we haven't actually said anything about what this procedure is doing. Right? Presumably the person calling this has some expectations about what it'll actually do. And to provide those properties, we need to add an insurer's clause and say, here's what we're gonna return, here's the properties of what we're returning. So in this case, we want to ensure that the output array, oops, that's the wrong thing, that the output array is equal to the input array. All right, and unfortunately, Daphne can't see that that's true. And this is a case illustrating the incompleteness of the tool. So this is perfectly correct software, but Daphne can't see that on its own, and so we have to give it a, one more little bit of help here, which is to add one more invariant that tells it what we've been doing in this loop at each iteration. So I'm gonna say that for all j, that are between zero and the, the value that we're about to do, then we've correctly done the, the copy. All right, so we're kind of keeping track of our progress through the course of this loop. This invariant is untrusted, so Daphne will verify that it's true when we get to the while loop. It'll then verify that the loop preserves that invariant, and then it'll attempt to use that invariant to prove the post condition. And in this case, it, it goes through. Okay, so hopefully this gives you some sense of what it's like to develop verified software. You're writing software kind of like you normally would, except that you, as you go along, are adding pre and post conditions to either prove that you are not making mistakes or to provide properties to the caller so that you can ultimately prove some high level property like I've computed RSA correctly. Okay. All right. So back to our regular program here. All right, so hopefully that gives you a sense of how we're proving that our software is correct but correctness is not quite the same as security, right? For security, we want to talk about information leakage. In particular, we don't want the secrets leaking either through digital side channels, right, so through the timing that the program takes or through the memory accesses that it makes, nor do we want to leave our secrets lying around in memory, right? So after the program executes, we'd like to leave it in a nice clean state and not rely on the operating system to clean up after us. So when I say digital side channels, what I mean is if the cryptographic program is taking in a public input and a secret input, and we allow the adversary to see some side channels observations, there should be no correlation with the secret input, okay? More formally, we can say that if we imagine two runs of the program where the public inputs are held constant, so you get the same public input, and we give two different secret inputs, then the outputs or the observations that the adversary sees should be indistinguishable. And if that's the case, then he can't have any idea which in secret inputs we were using, and so we can infer that our, our secrets are actually being protected, okay? So more formally, for all pairs of secrets and for all possible public values, the observations you get from running the, the program on input P and S1 should be equal to the observations you get running it on P and S2. Okay, so what does that look like in our, our general framework? Well, I told you that we're specifying hardware, right? So for functional correctness, we say that the, the hardware consists of some number of cores, a flat array of memory, and some I.O. state. The cores have registers, they have um, some segments and paging and other sort of gory details. And then we're also specifying instructions. So for example, we say that the add instruction, if it takes two registers, is going to read the two values, do a, a addition, modulo to 32, and store the re result back in one of the registers. Now, to talk about information leakage, we need to augment that with additional information. So in particular, we're going to add a trace field to the state. And the trace is going to represent all the things that the adversary might have observed as we execute the program. And then we're going to expand our semantics to add things to this trace. So in particular, every time we hit a branch, we're gonna record which branch we took. So we're gonna say either we took the true branch or the false branch. And every time we have an instruction that reads or writes to memory, we're gonna add the address to that trace. And so statically, you can think about this trace growing and growing as the program executes. And what we have to prove is that that, that trace is in, uh, independent of the secrets that the program might be processing. So in particular, we're gonna take this hardware specification and we want to prove that we meet this non-interference leakage specification that I showed you earlier. And we wanna do that for the cryptographic code that we've developed. And of course, we're gonna develop a whole bunch of cryptographic code. And that starts to sound a little bit painful, right? We're gonna have to do this complicated non-interference proof for every cryptographic algorithm we develop, and we're lazy people. So instead of doing that, we developed a verified leakage analysis. So in particular, what this means is that we actually wrote an analyzer program in our verifier tool, in this case, F-star, that takes in an AST representing the program and outputs yes or no saying either this is leaking secrets or no, it's not. We then write a proof that this analyzer is sound and we, that proof is proven correct against the leakage specification that I showed you earlier. So given that proof, we can trust the output of the analyzer and say if it says it's sound, then we're in good shape. The pr proof effort is one time because once we've proven the verifier correct, we can run it over multiple instances of different cryptographic algorithms and the specification is trusted 
but it's very succinct. So it, so it fit on one side in math, and it's not too much worse when we make it mechanically verified. So now that we've got this verified leakage analysis, we can run all of our different cryptographic algorithms through it and amortize the effort we put into that one-time proof. Now, when you're doing this kind of leakage analysis, historically there's been a, a major challenge around aliasing. Right, so if I show, show you this program that's storing a zero to the address held in RBX, and then later we're reading from our, the address stored in RBX and sticking it into RCX, I might add, insert an additional store here that's going to the value in RAX, okay? So then if I ask you what value does RCX to have, does it have a zero or does it have 10, the only way you can answer that is if you know whether RBX and RAX are aliased, if they, if they overlap, right? Okay, unfortunately this is a, a difficult problem and historically people have chosen different compromises along the way. So one option is to do the analysis in some higher level, simple, simpler language, where it's easier to see where the aliases are happening. Unfortunately, historically, we've seen that compilers are prone to inserting side channels as they, they do the compilation. Most of them are not designed with side channels in mind, and so that seems a little bit dicey. Another option is to do implement pointer analysis. There's loads of literature on doing pointer analysis on programs written in C and other languages, but unfortunately, those, those techniques are inherently imprecise. And so you wind up rejecting programs that you might otherwise accept. Or you could go the other way and say, well, you're probably not doing any aliasing, we'll just assume that you're not. Unfortunately, cryptographic software, including cryptographic software written by OpenSSL that we're trying to emulate, actually does use aliasing all over the place. And so this would not be a sound assumption. Fortunately, with Veil, we're actually able to take a, a very different approach based on the fact that we're already doing a bunch of work to prove the functional correctness of our code. And we can fig figure out a way to leverage that effort and turn that to the purposes of leakage analysis. So in particular, if you're doing functional verification, say you want to prove the output is going to have a particular value, you already have to prove the fact that RAX and RBX are different. Otherwise, you won't be able to talk about the output in a sensible way. And so what we do is we have the, the developer, as they're writing their software, actually add annotations to say, hey, the store, I believe, is storing secret values. When I load, I believe it's loading public values. And those values are checked along with all the other functional verification, and then once they've been checked, they can be soundly used as part of the analysis. So that's gives us a system that gives us so fast, secure, and correct software. We've used it on a variety of implementations just to prove the, the diversity and to support the comprehensiveness of Evercrypt. And so we've used it for things on ARM, on x64, and along the way we've actually found some vulnerabilities in the OpenSSL code that we were porting over to our system. Some of the key lessons we took away is that as we ported these algorithms to different platforms, the, the uh, lemmas and other proofs that we developed for one platform actually translated fairly nicely to other platforms, so we were able to amortize our effort. And it actually was non one of the most non-trivial parts was understanding those invariants that the OpenSSL developers had in their heads and that unfortunately are not, not terribly well documented along the way. We were also able to leverage our automation to actually get a lot of those optimization proof incorrectly without a lot of work from the, the developers. In particular, developing the Veil tool and the analysis around it was fairly intensive, but most of the implementations, particularly the ones that were ports from other platforms, were fairly straightforward. So give you a quick summary, Veil is, allows us to do correct, fast, and secure software. It's very flexible that, and allows us to match the optimizations that are used in popular and fast, unverified systems. And it allows us to do more exotic, uh, verified analysis, such as the leakage analysis I showed you. Okay, so that's the assembly code. Let's quickly look through the other parts of Evercrypt. So in particular, we don't want to write everything in assembly. It'd be nice to have, uh, write the easy parts in C and also write the parts that are gonna be generic across platforms in C. So we do that by developing in a fragment of F-star, which is an imperative looking fragment that we can actually extract to C code and verify that against the high, same high level specifications that we've already written in F-star. Those high level specifications themselves can be extracted to OCaml and we can use that to test the specifications to check for obvious errors that we may have introduced along the way. So for example, you might write uh, SHA looking something like this. If you squint a little, if you've done some functional programming before, this shouldn't look too unfamiliar. Right? We're computing some bitwise operation on X, Y, and Z, and we're pulling values out of the hash. And each one of these lines corresponds pretty directly to the C code that gets submitted on the other side. Of course, this raises a lot of problems. If we're interoperating between C and assembly, they have different memory models about how they think about memory. They have different calling conventions when you're calling from assembly into, or from, from C into assembly based on what platform, what OS, what compiler you're using. And of course, there's different ways of reasoning about side channels. So you can see our paper, there's various solutions to that that re resolve this tension and allow us to soundly interoperate between these two pieces. So of course, that tells you, you know, how we're writing low-level cryptographic primitives, but ultimately we want to assemble these into cryptographic constructions. 
right? So we want to verify, and, and so let me give you a flavor of what we're doing, taking from the, the TLS record layer. So here, we're going to be verifying the property of, of stream encryption, and so we need to have a formal definition for what that means. Hopefully everybody remembers that, that says that we're gonna take some plain text message, we're going to fragment it into pieces that'll fit into network packets. Each of those, net, each of those fragments will be encrypted, we'll send the ciphertext over, the other side is going to decrypt and reassemble some uh, prefix, pre prefix of that message, right, because some messages may be lost or may not have arrived yet. The property we would like is that we'd like to model this as some ideal log, right? So when you do encryption, we stick the plain text into the log, we randomly sample the ciphertext, and that's what actually gets sent on the wire, and then decryption just consists of looking in the table and finding one of those values and, and returning that to the caller. And so what does it mean for it to be secure? It means that an adversary should not be able to distinguish between the real and the ideal, except for some negligible bound, okay? But of course, the implementation we have in practice is much more complex, right? We've got PRFs, we've got one-time one max, we've got all these different packets being fragmented, and it's a, a very hairy piece of code. And yet we want to verify it against that high-level simple description. So the way we do that is that we assume that we have a, a block cipher, and we model it as a, a PRF, and we formally specify what that means. And then we go through a number of, of steps to prove that we actually meet that high-level uh, cryptographic-based definition. We prove just functional correctness. We actually prove the cryptographic soundness of the, the implementation itself in a way that looks very similar to a standard cryptographic proof, except that it's about the implementation rather than about a, a paper description of the system. And this involves not just the kinds of proofs I've showed you earlier, but also proofs about memory safety, proofs about injectivity of the way in which we handle messages, all kinds of intermediate theorems that we have to prove in order to get these, these high-level properties. One of the nice things that comes out of this is that we can actually get very concrete bounds. So for particular implementations, we can tell you, here's the exact formula for the, the adversary's advantage for this particular construction for the code that's actually going to execute. And so we can say for this implementation, here's exactly when you need to start, say, rekeying your connection. So it's only safe up to this number of messages. So in, we need to, once we're given all these cryptographic constructions, we need to stitch it together in a way that's going to offer a, a clean, agile interface to people who are developing software on top of it. So how do we do that? One way is through abstraction. So when you're using these automated tools, one of the banes of your existence is too much information, right? Automation does really well when you give it the correct information. If you give it too much, everything bogs down and development gets rather miserable. So we actually wind up abstracting not just the implementations, but even the specifications themselves, right? So at a high level, the caller only cares that, say, I implemented a, a compression function. It doesn't care about all the details of exactly how SHA is going to operate. And so we abstract at that level. We also use uh, generic programming all over the place. So I showed you this example of compress earlier that takes in an algorithm and has state de that's defined based on that algorithm. Unfortunately, that's not something you can easily extract to see. Why not? Because the, the internal state of the SHA function actually depends on which algorithm you're doing. Right? So some SHA algorithms, you have 32-bit state. Other algorithms, you have 64-bit state. Right? And so in C, you could, in theory, do that via a union. But that's going to be kind of ugly code, and it's not going to be very efficient. So instead, what we do is we rely on partial evaluation. So before we emit code, we actually evaluate it for individual algorithms and produce code that's customized for each one of those. And that way, we have code that's efficient and can be extracted to sort of idiomatic looking C. Finally, we, internally, we actually do a, a variety of multiplexing steps so that we can choose between an optimized implementation done in Vail and the generic version in C. And that, that choice can be based both on static configuration. So you can statically choose and say, I don't want to use assembly, maybe because you're doing testing. And we can do dynamic discovery of CPU features using things like CPU ID. Fortunately, despite all the complexity happening underneath, we actually have a single agile specification that we export to clients. So all of the cryptographic code, whether it's written in C or assembly or a mix of the two, is verified against the same exact specification. And so the caller knows that byte for byte, the output is gonna be exactly the same, and so they don't have to care about what's happening internally. So let's very briefly touch on what we can do with, with software written this way. So we've developed a number of higher level constructs, things like HMAC, HKDF, Merkle trees, a uh, portion of the quick specification that does transport encryption. And the nice thing about this is that each one of these can in turn offer an agile, uh, abstracted interface to their clients in turn. And so the Merkle trees, for example, can be instantiated with any hash function that we've implemented, and it's a single line change to say, I want to do SHA-2 or I want to do SHA-3 and the entire Merkle tree implementation still continues to function. So the actual Merkle tree implementation is a optimized version that's designed to be incrementally constructed, so you only have to do on average one hash computation to extend the tree, and we're keeping a whole bunch of the recent nodes in memory so that we can be even faster. 
despite this additional complexity for performance reasons, we can actually prove that it's implementing a Merkle tree and give a cryptographic proof showing that if you find a collision on a Merkle tree, we can reduce that to a collision on the underlying hash function, which is exactly the property we'd like to have. And this is a non-trivial property, right? So there was the Bitcoin implementation of Merkle, Merkle trees like this actually had a flaw that was in the implementation for about three years before anybody noticed. So I've talked a lot about performance. I'd like to give you some more sort of specifics about what that means. But the high level takeaway is that Evercrypt is able to match or exceed the performance of the best implementations out there, either ones that are verified or unverified. And so as an example, here's some performance for SHA-256. The first two bars are comparing OpenSSL and Evercrypt's portable implementations. Right, these are ones that are run on any platform. And here they're, they're fairly close. But if we get to the point where we're targeting and targeting individual platforms, you can see that we're at exactly parity with, with OpenSSL across all these different sizes. A similar story holds for authenticated encryption. So here we're looking at the targeted implementation of Evercrypt in blue and the targeted implementation from OpenSSL. And you can see that we're beating on ASGCM. We can actually beat OpenSSL's ASGCM and also their poly cha cha implementation. And we're at the point where we're at sub cycle latencies per byte on, on these implementations. Okay, so, so we don't have to say, oh, we're sorry, we verified the software, but it's really slow. It's actually some of the fastest software out there. As another example, if we look at Curve 25519, a popular let the curve these days, there's a variety of implementations in C and assembly. Some are verified, shown in green. Some are unverified, shown in red. And you can see that our portable implementation in C is actually beating the existing C implementations as well as some of the assembly implementations. And our assembly implementation, which is using some of the latest instructions from Intel, can actually beat all the other implementations out there that we're aware of and that we've tested. And so we no longer have to choose between performance and security. We can actually get both using techniques like this. So, and this also translates into good performance for the applications that we build on top of it. So this is showing that we can get over 2.7 million insertions per second into these incremental Merkle trees. That performance is consistent across as this tree grows, so we are getting this incremental property. And if you look at Bitcoin's implementation, we're actually outperforming them by almost 3x. Okay, so uh, again, this is not just some uh, micro benchmarks, it's actually translating into real world performance at the application level. So just to sum summarize, argue, I'm argued that cryptographic software needs to be both fast and secure if we want it to be used in the real world without a, a steady stream of vulnerabilities. We've developed a number of new tools and techniques that allow us to make this, uh, realize this, this desire in practice. And with Evercrypt, we can actually offer a uh, agile, multiplex, high performance cryptographic provider uh, to the world. And we're hoping that the larger Everest project will showcase the power of verification and its applicability to real world software. And so with that, all of our tools and software are available. Uh, they're all open source, so you're, you're welcome to check it out. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for your attention. There is time for questions. So uh, do you expect that your uh, implementation, so for example, on Curve 25519, will uh, stay uh, the fastest uh, practical implementation? Yeah, so that's a good question. And, and no, I don't, because I think all these algorithms, people are uh, innovating and improving all the time. So I think the important thing is not so much that, you know, we ha if you take a snapshot at any given moment, that, you know, at the moment we happen to be the fastest, but I don't think that's the important part. I think the important part is that we've shown that these tools are able to adapt and pick up these, these clever constructions. And so that's the place where we wanna be, right? We wanna be in a place where you can take these clever tricks that people are developing either academically or out in open SSL world, port them into something that's verified and prove that they actually got it right. So, I mean, wouldn't it make sense uh, to be able to take uh, the output of, uh, I mean, the output assembly language uh, for us, something like a algebraic program like Curve 25519 and just uh, prove the output result. Yeah, so, so one option would be to take the, the assembly that OpenSSL emits and say, okay, there's 20,000 instructions here, we're going to just verify it in one shot. Uh, we found that as a developer, it's much more pleasant to develop it in a, a modular fashion to verify, say, the loop before it gets unrolled rather than after. And that seems to be a, a at least in our experience, a, a friendlier, more, more scalable way of doing the verification. Okay, S thank you. Sure. Thank you. So very nice talk, thank you. 
Um, I was wondering, when you're verifying the correctness of the assembly programs, you need to have a specification somewhere of the semantics of each assembly instruction that is being used. Yeah. And there's, well, lots of them, and some of them are really, really complex. So I was wondering, um, where do they come from? Are you sharing that code base with other projects, or are you handwriting all of those semantics? Or Yeah, it's a great question. This? Like, I mean, if you look at the Intel manuals, they're, you know, they stack up at least as high. Um, fortunately, what we found is that we don't actually need that many assembly instructions for the kind of cryptographic software we're doing. So we've actually only specified something on the order of 50 or 60 assembly instructions, and that covers about you know, all the algorithms I showed you. And over time, we, we gradually expand that as, as needed. Um, and we're able to do that in part because if you look at something like XOR, right, Intel specifies, I think, 22 different flavors of XOR. We specify one. Um, and so we just say, you can't use the other 21 varieties, and that's enough to you know, make progress. In terms of complexity, yes, some of the instructions get complex, but we are able to avoid some of that complexity, again, by avoiding some of, just saying, okay, you're gonna use the instruction in this particular way, or by uh, writing the, we're able to write some of the properties in a more functional style, so that, that gets us some, some benefits as well. But so far, at least all of our specifications have been handwritten. Um, there have been some, proper, some projects at, say, ARM, about releasing their own mechanical uh, specifications, and I'd be more than happy to use those, they just weren't available when we started the project. Similarly, I think uh, some folks at UIUC just released a, a massive uh, specification for x64, and I think that is also an awesome project, and we would be more than happy to validate our, our specifications against theirs and eventually start using those specifications as well. I think that's a, you know, to the extent that the whole world can start agreeing on verification or ver specifications for the hardware and all start testing and contributing back, I think that's a, a good place to be. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you for your talk. This is very interesting. Um, it's a very clever approach to taking uh, this input from this tool and rendering assembler and, and assembling it with standardized tools. Do you also take a step of um, verifying the binary machine code that was generated by the tools to make sure the tool actually generated what you intended? Yeah, it's a good question. So right now we're trusting the assembler to correctly emit machine code. We have not yet taken that extra step to say, you know, let's specify how to interpret the, the machine code and check that back against the, the original assembly. Um, partly because it's tedious. <laughs> Part, partly because the specification for what that's supposed to look like might not be that much smaller or simpler than the assembler. Right, so if you take a, a small, simpler assembler, what is it doing? It's basically looking at the assembly instruction and, and mapping that to a series of uh, binary values. What is your specification going to look like? It's gonna say, take this assembly version, uh, instruction, map it to binary value. So you might get some leverage because again, as I said earlier, we don't have to include all the instructions. We could write an assembly that just tar targets ours. So you might get a little bit of leverage, but historically, I guess we're more concerned at, at higher layers. Um, okay, thank you. Sure. Um, I, I actually expect that you've already said it, but I didn't catch it. Are you, uh, uh, compatible with OpenSSL at the uh, source code level? I mean, can a client uh, switch between Everest and OpenSSL? That's a great question. So to do that, what, uh, we're working on a creating an OpenSSL engine, which is their their way of adding a plugin to the, the, the code. Um, they just changed that recently, and so we are, have somebody that's working on that sort of trying to map their interface to our interface. Um, I think we're always gonna need some mapping like that because we've been trying to design our API to be a little bit more in a, somewhat different fashion than OpenSSL chose to develop their API. Uh, but given that mapping, it, sh it should be straightforward to plug in. Thank you. Sure. Hi, um, you, mentioned, you mentioned that uh, you had also this tool that when you implement, say, a particular mode for authenticated encryption gives you also the bounds. Uh, I was wondering what happens if you implement a scheme that is broken like OCB2, would you find a failure in the proof? Yeah, so with any of these, these implementations, what you typically find is if, if you implement a broken scheme or if you implement a broken implementation, then somewhere inevitably the, the verifier says, no, sorry, I'm not gonna accept this program. And typically you react to that, as, as you saw with my, my demo, by saying, oh, okay, I must have screwed something up. Let me see if I can you know, figure out how to convince the tool that I'm, I actually have something correct. I'll add more invariance, I'll add more pre preconditions. And if the tool still sits there and says, no, I'm not gonna let this go through, eventually you start to think, okay, maybe, Maybe there's a problem here. Actually, in, that's how, uh, in the process of developing, say, the, the TLS layer, we actually discovered some uh, vulnerabilities in the, the specification itself, because the proof just wouldn't go through, and you sat there and stared at it long enough, and you realize, oh, actually, there is a, a flaw here. And the same thing would happen on, on the cryptographic side as well. Thank you. 
Hi, Brian. Nice talk. Thank you very much for it. Um, this is more of a nebulous question, so maybe there's no good answer. But um, you're sort of coming down from uh, software into the, the processor and having to sort of deal with whatever semantics the processor provides. Um, I wonder if there's any, <clears throat> excuse me, if there's any, I don't know, experience that you gain from that that gives insight into how we should be building processors. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I think there's a couple things. I think one is that I really like this trend of, say, ARM exposing formally, formal specifications for their API. Right? That saves me a ton of work. I don't have to go off and you know, painfully interpret their, their English prose. And furthermore, those, those have been extensively validated in a way that we, we haven't done with our, our, our specifications. I think the second part is that right now, even those specifications that ARM is providing us with only talk about functional properties. Right? They say, here's what an add does. It takes two values, it adds them, and sticks it back in. Nobody has a formal specification, and very few have a, even an informal specification of what security properties you're supposed to have. Right? So when we're talking about non-interference, we start writing the specification of what observations the adversary is making. Right? That's based entirely on the sort of lore from the, the security world. Right? And so we say, well, you should, shouldn't use divide, because we all know that that's uh, you know, input sensitive. But there's no specific, like, if you look in the Intel manual, it doesn't say anything about that. And so that, that's not a great place to be, it's not a firm foundation. And so what we would much prefer is to have some specification where the hardware people could say, hey, this is the security guarantee we're willing to make to you. Here's a formal specification of how it behaves. And then we can write secure software and prove that our software is secure against that. And hopefully the hardware people could be proving that their hardware is actually meeting that, that obligation. I think right now there's not even agreement on what form that would take. Right? And so I mean, you could extend our approach and just say, we're going to create this tracing, we're going to fill it with everything the hardware is doing. But as a software person, that, that's way more information than I want to have. As a hardware person, nobody wants to sort of bind their hands that way, right? You don't want to expose all that information because then you can't change it. So I think we as a community need to sort of come up with a consensus of what language should we specify that in and how can we sort of meet in the middle of there. Cool, thank you. Okay, so let's thank uh, Brian again for a wonderful talk. Lunch is served.